So a very warm welcome to you all to this webinar on GDPR and data protection compliance. Today, we'll be finding out from Gavin and Martin from Moodle how Moodle empowers institutions. Together with my colleague Martin Hoxie from ALT, I'm delighted to welcome so many of you today. And I wanted to emphasize that we are recording this session. Website afterwards. And also, if you have any questions during the session, you can raise them in the chat. We'll do our best to pick them up during the session and also at the end. Now, on behalf of Felt, I'd like to very warmly welcome our two presenters who are joining us today. Um, we are being joined by Gavin Henrik, a Moodle Business Development Manager. Hello, Gavin. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Hi there, um, this is Gavin um, from Moodle. Um, a lot of you probably already know me from running the Moodle MOOCs for the last few years in, in the UK and Ireland and being active in the community. And I've been to quite a few of the ALT conferences as well. So hello to you all. A very warm welcome to you. Um, and I think we're also being joined intermittently at the moment um, by Martin Joramas, a Moodle founder and CEO. So Martin's just been dropping in and out of the session, but um, hopefully he'll be with us and connected um, properly in a moment. Um, while we're just... All right, so look, sorry about that, everybody. Um, so hello, I'm Martin Dugiamas from Moodle. Um, and uh, with Gavin, we're going to just give you a quick overview of uh, what we've been doing lately uh, regarding GDPR in the Moodle core product, particularly. Um, as you know, GDPR affects uh, everybody. Um, and so we also have a lot of other systems that are involved in Europe. And we also, we're also working on all of those. So that's all our community sites and uh, our business operations and Moodle Cloud and um, uh, even some of the new things we're working on too. But this is specifically uh, about the Moodle open source product that so uh, many of you are using. And uh, we wanted to give you a bit of a, uh, some highlights of what we've been doing. So Gavin, if you wouldn't mind, go to the next slide. Um, so a very quick uh, backdrop on, on GDPR. Um, so it is an EU regulation. Um, it's about personal data for EU citizens. And uh, it's a very good initiative. I'm really behind it uh, philosophically. I think this is what the internet has needed. Um, something to harmonize data privacy laws and set new standards. And also to um, leverage uh, the power of um, that regulation to, to force IT institutions to, to um, start implementing some of this stuff. And so there are, um, there's a deadline of 25th of May and there are steep fines possible. And that has helped a lot of organizations uh, finally address this stuff properly, even though a lot of what's in here has already been around in some form or another um, as a recommendation. Uh, now everyone has the incentive to implement these things. Um, but it's good for us all as individuals going forward. So uh, next slide there. So uh, GDPR is really focused on personal data and that can include things like names, addresses, health information and photos, um, the obvious things. But it also applies to any information posted online in social media and even IP addresses in certain cases. So your, the address you're coming from um, uh, is also a, a factor here. So there has to be a, a lawful basis for any company to collect and pr process data. And when I say company, I mean organization, uh, and that includes the many users of Moodle, um, that the, the, the data should, uh, should ask, uh, sorry, the organization should ask for consent from individuals. Um, uh, Gavin, you might want to switch off your microphone actually. Um, there's, uh, it, it's, uh, we have to ask for consent for d collecting data for specific purposes. Um, and that's to protect people so individuals know what's being collected and why it's going to be used. Um, and uh, uh, the universities are in particular um, uh, are collecting quite a lot of personal data and uh, a lot of 
data that gets um, shared in the context of a course is subject to all of this stuff. Um, there's also the concept of right of access. So any individual has the right to get access to their personal data. And that's something that a lot of systems were not designed um, with from the beginning. And so they need to be, uh, that needs to be added to a lot of systems, including Moodle. Um, and there's also the right to erasure. So in certain circumstances, the, the data subject or the individual has the right to ask for their data to be erased. Now, there are exceptions to that, and particularly in education when um, you need data to be uh, available for other people's work or for, for other people's purposes in a shared collaborative system. Um, but all of those cases just have to be defined well and treated properly. But there is the basic right to erasure that people have. So going for on here, um, there are three big terms that you'll hear a lot around GDPR, um, and these are just shorthand for uh, certain concepts um, that, uh, that help us uh, decide who is responsible for things. So uh, the data controller is any organization that collects and stores the personal data. So it's, the, um, it's actually about where the data is stored and who's actually uh, controlling that, uh, that data. That's uh, different to a data processor. So a data processor is the organ and any organization that processes that personal data, whether or not on the data controller's um, actual uh, uh, systems. And uh, most organizations uh, should have the role of a data protection officer. So it's a contact point uh, for monitoring data protection compliance in that organization, for performing uh, impact assessments. Uh, they're the contact for external people and also internal people. Uh, and they are independent. They shouldn't be really deeply involved in the systems themselves. They should. Uh, report to the highest management level of the organization so that they're not they don't have conflicts of interests about um, being um, involved in the building of the systems that they're uh, responsible for, for for studying and and looking over so those are some of the basic glossary terms um, what we've been doing and um, I'll be the first to admit that I, I would love it we if we'd started all this a lot earlier but the, the concepts here are necessarily difficult, I think, for IT people to understand. And um, a lot of us um, in the whole community, I think, have taken quite a while to really comprehend the extent of this regulation and, and the amount of work that we all have to do. Um, and uh, so I think most, most companies are scrambling and, um, uh, and only releasing things like now even though it's only next month for this uh, deadline. But um, that said, for the last uh, eight months or so, we've been working very hard on, um, on what, we, what, we, what we need to do. So we've been working with a privacy and um, compliance specialist lawyer from the EU um, who's been guiding us with their specifications of what we need to be doing. Uh, really great guy. He's um, been um, super helpful and continues to be. Uh, we've gone through and built a lot of user stories and technical specs from that. And we had two dedicated development teams inside Moodle HQ just focused on the GDPR implementations. And this was most of our core devs, in fact. So we haven't done much else in the past uh, cycle than this. Um, so it really was number one importance over anything else we were doing. So there are two main sections. One is on the registration and consenting of users, and the other is about um, handling subject ac access requests and erasure and uh, the data registry. Um, as part of that, we've implemented a whole new privacy API inside Moodle, which is the foundation of all of the work that our community still needs to do. So a lot of the community have produced plugins some of them are published centrally in our plugins database, but many of them are not. And many of them, the institutions, uh, various institutions have made their own plugins for their own purposes, which is one of the beauties of Moodle, that it's so uh, flexible and customizable. But it means they will also have to do this work on that code to make it um, fully, uh, to make a fully compliant system. 
And mostly that's just about uh, each plugin needs to be able to identify the, the personal data that, that, that they individually store um, and, uh, and expose that through the API. So more about this as we go on. So uh, next slide, Gavin. So um, uh, we've started by implementing uh, as much as we can as plugins, and that's so that um, because we know not everyone's going to want to or will be able to upgrade to Moodle 3.5, which is our next release, and will include all this new um, all this new software um, that comes out in May. But uh, for people who are still on slightly older versions, 3.3 and 3.4. Uh, you would need to go and um, you need to install these plugins on top of your system and uh, and use those. And we tried to make them as comprehensive as we possibly can, um, but they will they will continue evolving um, over coming uh, months and years of, uh, as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and we'll be maintaining those plugins, you know, uh, for the three point three and three point four. Um, and, um, and 3.5 uh, going forward. So you really should be on one of those releases to fully take uh, advantage of these. There is some talk about uh, some people porting these plugins back to Moodle 3.2 and maybe earlier. That's not our, fo our focus right now uh, because we've got more than enough on our plate implementing everything for the last uh, three versions of Moodle. So go on uh, forward, uh, Gavin. Um, so these are the two major plugins. The first one is the policy plugin, which is all about the sign-on process and the uh, defining policies and um, showing them to users. And then there's the data privacy plugin, which is really about the, the workflow for those users once they're in the system. So if we just push forward to the next one, Gav. So uh, this is the uh, uh, some of the workflow that happens in the policy plugin, and it's about um, the the signing up process. So during sign up, um, depending on the age of students, uh, you may need to ask them: Are they over the age of consent? Uh, if they are not over the age of consent, so they're quite younger students, then um, the that they can't proceed with making an account. Uh, themselves. As soon as you even ask them for names or email addresses, uh, you are already you start getting into privacy of personal data. So we can't even continue with the process. At that point, we just ask them to go to the admin, and there's going to have to be a different custom process for how you get that student into the system. Uh, and that'll be a local process uh, just for you. The Gavin, you've skipped slides there. Can you go back one, please? Yep. Uh, so the uh, once uh, well, if they are over the age of consent, then you can uh, continue, and the and the login process will uh, take them through, showing them all the current policies on the site. Uh, they need to consent to each one of them individually, and if they do, then they go through the user registration and create an account um, as usual. Now this only applies for when you have users signing up themselves. In most for most institutions, they would have connected Moodle with a student information system or a, um, if it's a company, a human resources system. And generally, these accounts are created automatically anyway. But for those cases where Moodle is used this way, we, we had to implement the process. So if you go on a bit, next one. <clears throat> um, so the, the digital aid of con consent part of this, uh, we, uh, it, it defaults to 16, but different countries have different age requirements. And uh, in the plugin, we have a way for the admin to set it up for what for their own situation. If they're accepting students from all over the world, then you can um, enter in all the countries and their age of consents, uh, and and Moodle will handle it. Um, if of course you're an institution in just one country, it's going to look a lot simpler. So go on. So the policy pages, uh, these are you, you're able to set policies uh, for the site uh, about privacy or about any other topic. Um, and Moodle has interfaces now for the administrator to define these uh, policies. And 
An example you you'll know from most sites in the past couple of years is you know uh, the little pop up that you see that says uh, we are using cookies on this site. Um, you know, do you agree? So it's just like a very short policy shown to you when you first get there. Um, that's an example of what we can now define. Um, but we can have you can have any policy you like, and uh, we we have to leave it up to you because every individual site is going to be quite different. So let's go to the next next one. Uh, so this is the consent page that shows the summary. So first you see uh, the full policies and then you're taken to a summary and overview. So you see them a second time and you can see all the policies and you can agree to them individually and Moodle records uh, the, uh, the agreements. Um, so go on to the next page there, Gavin. Uh, and then once uh, you've agreed to policies, uh, you see uh, they, they're all recorded. This is an overview that the site admin or the privacy officer can see uh, for each person, uh, which of the policies they've agreed to. Now, something about the policies is that we have version management in there. So if you update a policy, you can, you can fix a simple typo that doesn't materially affect the content. And in that case, you're allowed to just to uh, make a, a, a you know, change to the policy without getting everybody to agree to it again. But if you do make any substantial changes to the policy, then you are, then you are required that all users see that again and re, uh, re-consent to that policy. And so Moodle does handle all those versions and uh, tracks them. Uh, the next time those users log in, they'll be shown those policies and um, uh, they have to re-agree. Um, next slide. Um, policies can be set to uh, particular types of users and um, even guests may have to see policies and uh, then you can see it, it looks a bit like this. Um, can you go on, Gavin? I wish I was controlling the slideshow. <laughs> anyway, here we go. So. Um, the, the data privacy, the, that, all of that was just the, uh, the policy plugins and how they work. Uh, we can show you some more screenshots uh, later if there's any questions. The uh, data privacy plugin is about what happens after. So once a student or, or a teacher, any user, is in the system and they need to um, interact to get their data or erase the data, they need to talk to the data protection officer. Now we, we could have just put an email link and let it all handle be handled via email, but we chose to do it as a system inside Moodle because um, it, uh, it, it really uh, helps people focus, I think, um, and, and do this service properly. I think to have it integrated in Moodle um, shows how serious we are about this and that Moodle wants to handle these things. Uh, we really wanna uh, give the affordances to da your data protection officer or your data privacy officer to, to handle this stuff, or the data protection officer. So uh, this is an example. Uh, once, the t once a student has filled out the, the form, clicked on the link and, uh, and sent the request, there is an interface where the DPO can see all those requests and take action on it. Um, so they move through a variety of um, statuses. They start off waiting for approval. Uh, you can um, accept that and review the data and approve it. Now, once you approve it, um, it, it enables, uh, Moodle is able to uh, process that request and in the background, it'll start generating a zip file. If they wanted a copy of all their data, then Moodle will generate a zip file um, with all their data. Now that zip file is, um, a quite easy to read structure. It's something a, even a, a student can have on their desktop and open and browse and they'll see all the images they've uploaded, all the files like PDFs or Word documents they've uploaded in the system. But also texts such as forum posts, attachments, uh, assignment submissions, everything. Um, as much as possible we try to make it really usable by the student or by the teacher. Um, in many cases though, the data is uh, database-like and so those are JSON files and they can be processed by a machine if necessary. There are no standards around 
how we do this. So we had to invent one. So let's call this the uh, the Moodle uh, personal data export format. And um, uh, we can go into more details about that uh, another time. Um, the data proxy plugin, uh, we've got one other um, uh, part to it, which is just being finished, which is the uh, about the data registry. And it has the, the purpose uh, to, we want to be able to define a retention period for certain data stored in Moodle. So it's about saying Moodle collects this sort of data for this purpose, and we only want to keep it for this amount of years um, or whatever it is. So for different courses or modules or blocks, um, you can now set what the purpose of the data in there is and how long you want to keep it. And defining that lets us um, be aware of the data we have and to treat it appropriately. So for example, you're, you might have a policy in the organization that uh, courses need to be kept for seven years online so that students can refer back to them or something. So you need to make that the policy and you need to, all the participants need to agree that their own data will be allowed to be online for seven years. You know, you need to justify that. So uh, this is an example of the interface uh, where it lets you browse through the course and uh, set different uh, data registry settings for each uh, each part of Moodle. And you, can, you don't have to go down to details, you can set it for the whole site at once, for example. The, the last important thing we want to talk about here is that it's you are responsible for your own compliance. Each organization needs to do this, needs to go through a process. Um, no software is going to be enough. Just what we've built in Moodle are affordances to make it easier for people to implement the and be compliant with the regulations. But um, just having that there isn't enough. So you need to configure it correctly. You need to implement it. You need to write the policies. And, and have those procedures. So we really highly recommend, if you haven't already, um, that you get independent legal advice about your own particular situation. Uh, use the tools that we've, we've provided. And if there's things that you need, if you realize that, the, that, that there are improvements to the tools that, that you think would really help, um, then get in touch with us because we really want you to um, uh, to you know, we want the community to really input into this. So, just lastly, in summary, um, we are implementing GDPR support uh, uh, new plugins. There are some small core changes, so it really only works with uh, the last three major versions of Moodle so far. Um, you can already get these plugins and, and play with them. They're on Moodle.org/plugins on, on the public plugin database. If you search for uh, GDPR, you'll find them. Uh, they will be built into Moodle 3.5 and later, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll continue evolving them as uh, necessary in response to community feedback. Um, and lastly, you are responsible for your, for your compliance, so uh, I do recommend everyone gets legal advice. And that's the end of our short summary. These were the slides uh, that uh, the, the team have put together. Our team of developers have been working really uh, hard on this for the, the last uh, uh, six to eight months. And um, uh, we, we, we think we're, we're hitting the sweet spot here of uh, simple tools that enable people to do this stuff. But it is a very difficult um, process for everyone to work through. And um, we're just trying to help as much as we can. So thank you. Uh, plenty of time for questions now. Wow, thank you very much, um, Martin and Gavin. That was a, a really great presentation, really insightful, and also really um, keen to hear about you know, how your values as an organization are kind of reflected in the actions that you've taken. Um, as you can see, there is a lot of interest that's being generated, a very lively chat. Um, but I think before we go and jump right into questions um, for you and Gavin, I just want to say um, a big thank you. And I hope that our participants can put their hands together and give you guys a, a big thank you, um, if a virtual one, um, for a really super great webinar. So thank you very much. Um, 
we do have a lot of questions um, that have come up in the chat. Um, but if you do have any questions for Martin or for Gavin, please um, post them as well. And I'm hoping that in um, we can also make the recording obviously available afterwards so you can go through any of the details. Um, Gavin, Martin, are you happy to um, have a look in the chat yourself and, um, and try and we'll um, pick out some of the questions that people might be raising? Um, so we'll just wait uh, for the applause to die down and then uh, we'll see what questions we have. Thank you, Mara. Um, so Gavin uh, hasn't done much yet except for answering all the questions in the chat, which is great. Um, Gavin, if you want to speak at any time, uh, answer anything, go for it. Okay, well, well I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit. So Michael said that should institution systems be doing this themselves rather than relying on Moodle? So my response is, well, um, obviously this is lots of different organizations. Some will have heavily integrated centralized systems, some won't. So Moodle has to be able to enable these affordances to all types of organizations using it. But the most important one for me is the majority of institutions have a contract of with their with their students. And contract by contract is one of the lawful basis for processing anyhow. But you still need to say what you're processing. And I've looked at a few university um, contracts with their students and not one of them actually specified, hey, we're going to be giving all your data to Google. We're going to be giving all your data to Blackboard by using Collaborate and specifying all these external systems that their data is going to be going to. So even when it comes to by contract, you still need to actually let the students know where their data is going to be. And I remember there was being debates on whether you could even force them to or not use these systems. That's a, a separate thing, because I know the ALS list had a discussion on that last year. Um, so yeah, I think that Moodle, for most institutions, will use these policies to augment all of the permissions and contractual basis that they have within their student contract. Like when they roll out a new system, maybe Blackboard Collaborate or something else. I think that's one of the, the main things for the big ones. All the small ones, it might be the only thing they have. <clears throat> um, there were some early ones from Zaman about UCL, about can a tutor request to be anonymous so a student doesn't know who marked their work? Right, so Zaman, that's a, a really even pre-GDPR issue. Um, and it's something where a student has a right to all personal data on them. Actually, the person writing it is their personal data and actually the student doesn't necessarily have the right to that. But if, so technically, um, that's, that's, that's an area where the institution will have to make a judgment call on it, um, of, of what their agreements, because a lot of institutions also have a charter with their students, which lets them know how much transparency and stuff there is. Um, but again, legal advice on what your, count, your current contract says. Um, is there any of these other ones here? If we download the plugins, will there be any issues when we upgrade to 3.5 in, Ju in July? So, Martin, do you want to grab that one? No audio. Uh, no, there won't be any problems at all. Uh, that's designed to be upgradable. And, and uh, so, yeah, no problem at all. Installing those and then upgrading, it's the same code. So, Rebecca's asked um, about the registry. It is a work in progress. It's not finished yet. So, bear with us on that, um, um, Rebecca. So, it's. Uh, it does work as in, as Martin outlined there that you can specify the purposes and so on. And if there is some things you need to have for a much longer or shorter, you can spec you can do your purposes to have it differently in there. So it is, but it is a work in progress. So there's a good one there. Uh, five years purpose to allow student data. Um, just um, sorry, Dave has various option fields like Yahoo wants to turn them off, don't need them. He can hide them, but he wants to empty the data in them. That's really outside of the scope of this work, Dave, but it might be something you want to put in as a plugin request um, within the whole GDPR and privacy area 
for ongoing after 3.6. If you're talking about having that as a general thing, that's more e-privacy than GDPR per se. Um, what about staff data? Well, that's a good one. So a lot of institutions won't re may not realize that their staff are, are, are data subjects too. So data subjects are have certain rights, but not everyone has all rights. So for example, uh, from a, a student point of view, where they might have the right of erasure for certain things, staff, because it is actually work product and probably, again, depending on, co on your contract, copyright to the institution, it might not have. So these are things that you're going to need to understand your own contracts with your staff, about ownership, copyright, and your students. And that's why Martin goes back to, you must get your own legal advice. We're not, we're just enabling you. We're not, we're not telling you what to do. Uh, I've just posted a link, uh, which I'll put on the presentation too at the end, actually. Uh, this says security and privacy forum on Moodle.org. Um, so if you have questions, if you're watching the recording and you have questions, uh, that's where you should go. Um, and even some of the questions here, which I don't actually know the answer to, uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, the team uh, answer them there in that forum. There's one there about how long will the zip file of data be available for? So I'm not sure yeah. that off the top of my head. For example, that's one I don't. I actually just asked the team if they know, but they're still answering. I, I don't know exactly. Um, so Ian, that's a great you, one to put on the forum. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what this is about Flash. Uh, yeah, we don't need any Flash. Agreed. Um, Rebecca, your point about the DPO request and deletion, there's still, some of this is still work in progress over the next few weeks. So bear with us and we'll, when it is released on, I think, May 14th, these plugins will be robustly um, finished by that point. So. Uh, ideally, though, of course, the, Rebecca, the, if you've deleted everything from an account, that would include the account itself, I imagine. Um, so that, I don't know why it behaved that way for you. Probably a bug. Um, sounds like something we should test. I see uh, Gerard's got his hand raised. Gerard, if you want to jump on the microphone and ask a question, you're welcome to do that. Uh, in the meantime, let's take some more questions from the chat. It's okay, Jared. So I think we're just going to focus on the questions in the chat. Were there any more you wanted to pick up, Gavin and Mom? Um, one thing that, that, that's come up in previous discussions is that uh, the GDPR stuff can look extremely scary, um, but it, it really it really isn't. It's just a matter of looking at your own um, setup, thinking like we've never thought before uh, as much about is about where the data is coming in and how it's being used and what it's being used for, and coming up with common sense. Um, policies around those that uh, that you can now explain to everybody. This is how we're using your data and uh, and why, and, uh, and and they can agree um, uh, or not agree. In which case, if they don't agree, then they shouldn't be in your organisation, right? They can't they can't do things that are necessary. So um, yeah, it's it's just working through that process. And um, I even though it is hard. And I, I've got a, a theory as to why it's hard for technical people, particularly because we are we are used to having access to everything. We can go to a database. We we can read people's emails. We have all this access usually, and um, to actually take that access away from ourselves is a funny feeling for a very technical person. And um, but that's what we have to do. That's what how systems should work. 
and and all of this legislation is um, a really useful um, push for us to fix these things up. So David just asked a really poignant question, and possibly it will explain why Moodle has gone around, where are gone about doing it the way we have. What is personal data? So it's called a sort of the text area conundrum. Now, if you were to think that a forum post, a teacher might, as an icebreaker in a course, go, hey, everyone, please introduce yourself, say where you're from, why you're doing the course, um, and what you're hoping to get out of it or something. So you're basically asking to share personal data. Oops. So that means now, if even one teacher in your school or college has done something like that, forum posts will probably have personal data which means then either you're, you're going to have to go through each one one at a time to make a decision on it, or it's just safer to assume every post someone has done may include personal data. So we've taken the approach that because it might have, let's just export it. Because if, there's a, if we didn't do it that way and there was even one post, then you'd be in a, then you, you'd be in a harder place having to do it manually unless you've got the time to go through a few 10,000 forum posts or something. So Martin, do you want to handle the erasing part of that? Uh, right, so um, yes, uh, the, the approach taken with erasing is that if, assuming the policy is that you, you do allow erasing of something like a forum post, which is, Obviously, the experience of everybody else and in the context of a discussion is is part of that learning um, content that everybody else in the class would see. But assuming you allow people to delete their own entries, it obliterates the text. Exactly, Michael. Um, it keeps it there, but uh, replaces the text and anonymizes the user so that you can't read it or see who posted it. So it's, it still keeps the integrity of the discussion while removing their, their, con their personal data. And of course, one of the key things there is what you don't have to, if they've agreed to let that be available within their consent, within your contract, that's actually what the important thing is. Because you can just say, you know what, everything you do as part of your course is an intrinsic part of your course evaluation and therefore we need to retain this for seven years. It might not be. And again, you'll have to get a lawyer to advise you on whether that's doable or not, um, because there is a concept of excessive processing and so on that you're going to have to um, deal with it. Um, so yeah, back to get a lawyer, I think. Yeah, thanks, Martin and Gabby. No, that's really useful. Um, thank you. It's David from Alexia. She's done it. Well, um, Gavin, um, Martin, I think we've had a lot of um, questions already. I wonder if we maybe, um, given that we've been in the webinar for nearly an hour already, um, whether we want to maybe pick up um, one or two final points, or if you have any final points um, that you'd like to add um, before we, we close the session. I would just say that if there was two hours worth of Q&A, we would still not answer all the questions that people have. We've had months of Q&A internally and with our legal advice, and we're still coming up with new questions. So the forums are the best place to put those, which we haven't managed to answer yet. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure the discussion will be ongoing as the time of GDPR implementation comes closer. And it's been really, um, really insightful to actually hear you both think through some of the challenges and, and how you are approaching that. Um, so I think um, unless there is anything else um, from you, Martin, we might draw the session to a close. Any final thoughts from you? Uh, look, thank you, uh, uh, and thank you for the opportunity and the platform uh, to talk a bit about what we've been doing. Um, and uh, also, really, thank you for uh, Alt, and I really respect what Alt does. Um, I personally haven't been too much involved in uh, ALT events uh, before now, although I've wanted to be, and I'm going to try and get to some of your conferences uh, to to engage more. 
but thank you very much uh, for that chance. And uh, we, we are. Uh, I just really wanted to reiterate that um, that we we believe in the GDPR philosophically. It, it does fit in with our, our vision and the mission for the Moodle project. Um, as an open project, we have special challenges around this in that everybody takes Moodle and customizes it and makes their own learning management system from it. And it's a little different to say if we were just Facebook and we had to fix one system centrally. But um, I, I think that kind of openness is the sort of thing that is needed in education. And um, to support that, we all need to work on problems like privacy uh, and think them through and uh, solve it and make sure we have a better world for tomorrow where, where privacy is something that's just expected and part of the design of everything we build. Oh, thank you very much. I think that's a wonderful um, closing note to, to finish on and leaves us certainly with a lot to aspire to going forward. Um, so it just leaves me um, together with my colleague Martin Hawksey to thank you both again for a really great webinar and thank you all for participating as well. We will stop the recording now, but we'll put it online as soon as it's available.